What's happening, everybody? This is V3 Cast, episode 24, the official Voyager 3 podcast. My name is Steve. This is Aaron. This is Greg. All right. You do this too, Steve. Did you do that, Steve? I did one. I did one. I did 50%. Now we got 100%. Yes. All right. (laughs) All right. What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? What's going on? Good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Man, man, man. Tons of fun stuff happening. Um, but you gotta, you, you guys have to tell me about uh D and D cause I wasn't able to go. So yes, please it, d- don't spoil it of course, but, but no. tell me, tell me it was awesome. <laughs> it broke our hearts that you couldn't make it, but it was great. We, we, uh, saw it with you. We ate popcorn for you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I ate your share of popcorn. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> nice. I thought it was great. I thought it was pure joy that's all i thought for the whole movie this is yep. pure joy and fun there was nothing um that dragged there was nothing like you know when sometimes you see a movie and they nail the opening scene and you're like all right we're off to a great start and and then you're like you suddenly you realize you're halfway through and still good or great you know right and you're like as long as they don't screw up the ending and then you get to the end and you're like, holy shit, they nailed it. You know what I mean? That that's what that movie was. It was it was lighthearted for the most part. Um, you know, but it had it had some gravity of characters um and and stakes for all the care. Everybody had their own motivations and and uh their their own sort of their own personalities, and then it all coalesced into this great grand adventure with just tons of nods to the uh to the games and the books right. and, and everything. And, uh, it's awesome. you know, just to sit there and smile the whole time because they said Baldur's Gate. And I'm like, that's all you need, you right, know? Totally. So for people like us and people who are even way more into it than us and everything, it's just like, just to hear those things peppered through and see all the creatures and all those things. what do you think, Greg? Well, you should also mention that we saw it on the largest screen in Michigan. That we went true. to the Super Emacs. The Super yeah. Emacs, Aaron. Yes. Aaron. So Super. ginormous screen mixed with the fine, fine Dolby Atmos. You guys were living the life. Yes. It was yeah, such that, a big screen that I had to take a Dramamine. Yeah, oh, I man. yeah. That's saying something. Yep. That's yeah, almost like riding I, a roller coaster. I didn't want to hurl. <laughs> yeah. R- a riding a roller coaster screen. with swords and spells. Yes. Sound was great. Yep. It looked great. It's the perfect movie to see at a Super Emax. It is. I agree. Is. I'm, I'm going to get out there real soon and see it because I, I want to see it in the theater. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, well, the Super Emax. It's not yeah. on that screen anymore. That's the only oh. thing about the Super Emax is like the, right. when it's the next big quick. movie comes out, it, it goes. So now yeah. it's Mario Brothers. You know, no, or right. Super, well, Super. still seeing it on the big screen is definitely a good idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll catch it. I'm going to catch it this week, maybe, or this weekend. Um, cool. We did sneak out with the kids and we saw Super Mario Brothers and it was great. Honestly, cool. totally I saw that great. too. Totally I great agree. It was movie great for kids and the adults, especially if you played that game. They touch on like every iteration of that game, like the Mario Kart stuff, uh, the middle era stuff, and then of course the original. Um, awesome. Cool. Yeah, it was and, really good. And I'm not 100% sold on Dolby, Dolby Atmos. It is the best thing since sliced bread. There's no doubt. It is. <laughs> it is great when the seat rumbles. It's so good. You want to hear my non-spoiler review of Super Mario Brothers? Sure. Yeah. Usually when I go to like the Imagine Theater to see a kid's movie, what I treat it as is um, dad's nap time. You know, so I'll, <laughs> I'll usually watch like the first 20 minutes of whatever, you know, animated movie we're going to see. And if it doesn't hold my interest, I just turn the warmers on. On the, on the chair yeah then it's all I over lean, i lean it all the way back and i just i just nap for a half hour yeah. hour i wake yeah. up somewhere near the end and i'm like yep this ended exactly the way i thought it would <laughs> that's right but uh right. super mario brothers i stayed awake man it was good so that's my non-spoiler review kept that's me cool. awake nice man nice awesome all those tired dads out there know what i'm talking about they do <laughs> i was able to make it out on saturday to motor city legacy it is a uh you know horror centric convention uh not unlike motor city nightmares and uh maybe like astronomicon you know things of that nature 
Um, and they they were doing it at the Sheraton over there by the airport. I really wanted to make sure that I got out there uh, because a, a friend of ours who who we've worked with in the past, uh, the, the the gentleman who did all the special effects for Portal to Hell, uh, Stephen Kostansky, uh, was one of the guests there. Um, so it was uh, his latest film is called Psycho Gorman. And uh, two of the stars were there with him. So it was kind of like a little pack of, of the Psycho Gorman uh, contingent. So because we've kind of worked together on a, on, a, on a film a few years ago, and we're kind of internet chums, I decided I got to go there and I got to say hi in person and, and introduce myself and shake his hand and chit chat a bit. So we did. And uh, we were talking about all kinds of different things. I, I got a cool, uh, you guys are familiar with those uh, old like theater promotional booklets that they used to yep. make for films. Um, I have a couple already, but I got um, Flash Gordon one. Oh wow! Uh, there, and uh, we were talking so, about how good Flash Gordon is because you know he's watched that a million times, like we have. And uh, yeah. it was I was talking to him how how I really dug uh, Manborg. That's another one of his films. I think it might be his first film that he directed. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you know, good parts inspiration from like Mortal Kombat, Guar, and maybe Voltron all kind of mashed up on a kind of a lo-fi, uh, a lot of green screen type of uh, film. And it, it's great. It's really good. Uh, one thing that uh, Steven's really good at is uh, the characters. Um, so, you know, if something is higher budget or lower budget, it doesn't matter because you love his characters. Mm -hmm. So that's one of his strong suits for sure. Uh, plus, of course, all of his practical special effects are beyond on point. But uh, yeah, we, we, we were chilling. I also met a cool dude who uh, is fans of Voyager 3, too. His name is uh, Anthony uh, Moran. He has a company called Independent American Pictures. And um, th they have a new film out right now called Let Us In. And it's kind of like a zombie biker film. Uh, and it was filmed Sweet. in Detroit. So he, he gave me really? a copy of this on DVD. So um, this week, it's also on my list to check out that film. People in Michigan, man, doing good stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah, one... One last thing about that that convention that you went to, uh, the movie that we just did the song for, the movie theater, theater massacre, massacre played there. Oh yeah, and and check out what like I got, first, man. Are you ready? First public performance Look at this. showing. What is that? Nice. It's it's the one sheet uh, illustrated by the wonderful Graham Humphreys, who's done tons of stuff that. Uh, people who listen to this podcast know about and you guys know about he's done a lot of vinyl um jacket artwork and stuff like that for like death waltz and mondo and others like that so uh yeah ian got um graham to do the one sheet i gotta know i feel like i'm paul stanley yeah I you gotta sound know. like paul stanley <laughs> what are y'all drinking i know you like the taste of alcohol <laughs> uh i have who's this... going first Iron yeah. Maiden, another Iron Maiden beer. Man. It's like a special collector's bottle. It's the regular Iron Maiden Trooper beer, but this is the uh, Day of the Dead special. Um, wow. For, for uh, you know, in down in Mexico, they got right. that their Day of the Dead. Right, yeah. So this Iron time Maiden. we're not talking about the film. We're talking about the actual celebration. Yes. The, right. uh, Iron Maiden has fans all around the world, more fans than any other band in, in the world. And... Uh, and they have uh, all their Mexican fans. So they do all these little dedications to people, all their people all around the world. They have all that stuff to cover all these different countries and continents. So yeah, right. they did that. And it's a great beer. It's it's one of my absolute favorites, Iron Maiden Trooper beer. We don't get to hear you crack it open. Mm. <laughs> is that a dark beer? It's not beer, a twist off. Or is just the bottle dark? Just the bottle. Okay, <clears throat> gotcha, gotcha. I mean, so it's like a... It's is sort it an of IPA dark. or no? Sort, no, it's a, a British pub beer basically is is what they call it huh. does that I make don't sense even know about that i don't know like a pub a british ale i think is what they call it something no, like I heard, that. i've heard of ale and all of my yeah. years of playing D D. yeah there you go get yourself an ale <laughs> yeah <laughs> greg what you That's got great. man aaron that looks good man it's good and the bot the artwork is great i mean iron maiden is always always on point yeah yeah, Aaron's really uh, zeroing in on that trooper beer, man. I think that he's <laughs> yes, drinking that. I've been 20, celebrating he's drinking that every day. Yeah, I've been <laughs> celebrating uh, my accomplishments in That's life. That's right. That's right, man. And the warmer right, weather on the way. 
most people are expecting me to hold up an IPA, so I wanted to change it up a little. So this time I have a, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. You see what it says? I said what I said. Evil yeah. genius. Oh, Evil genius oh margarita. Key lime oh, margarita key lime, sour. Key lime margarita sour. So that's <laughs> not a beer at all, is it? No, it's a beer. Oh, it is. But okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a sour. So I never heard of a sour. Drink, usually I drink IPAs, you know, so I'm changing it up. You ready for the crack? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dang, that's, that's good real good. That was great. Wow. Yeah, you don't have to fix that in post. No, See, no, Steve, no that one is large and in charge right there. That's professional. I'm going to pour it into my rubber sole glass. Look at that. That's smooth. If you've never had a sour beer, you should try one. It's good for the... Uh, I really like sours in the summertime. And this is a seasonal one that they do that's all, that comes out in April. I don't know why it comes out so early, but I think sours are a great summer beer. There you mm -hmm. go, Aaron. You got something to add to your cooler. I'll check it out. Key or lime. Your, or your mini fridge. Or it's, like a, um, yeah. it's like a sour patch kit a little bit. You know, it's hard. It gets you right yeah, here. That's right. In the glands. Right there. Nice. All right. Well, hey, because I'm getting excited for this uh, warmer weather to come back, because we had it last weekend, if you recall. It was nice. Yeah, last yes. week. Then it dipped down nice. now to some insanity. But it's so, going to go back by up. By Thursday, we're looking good. We're looking like Voyager 3 tank top weather. You know, I, I Only for like a day. I know, but no, hey, I will take whatever I can get. Don't burst my bubble. I know. Only so, for a day, Aaron. Because I'm so excited for this upcoming warm weather and the warm weather season. First, I wanted to go for something big. Oh, so no. I grabbed my White monster mug. <laughs> so you got to have a proper glass to put this in, right? Is that wow. King Crimson? That's a, did you get yeah, that at the concert that's the or discipline you not nice. from the first 80s album. So awesome. Normally, you would see that surrounded by burgundy, you know, on, yeah. the, uh, on the on that one. Steve Shonen. Okay, are you ready? Mm -hmm. This is equal parts Fago orange. Oh shit! And Fago. Oh, he's doing a mix. Cream soda. Steve brought it back to nineteen eighty nine. So I do my cream sickle. Fifty yes. fifty. <laughs> 50-50 uh, of each one. Boy, Steve really prepared for this. Yeah, oh, Steve man. created this drink, Greg, back yeah, in 88 or 89. I'm, I think ICP would contest that. That's about half. That's about half right there. See, I don't know why. I'm telling you. Now, of course, they could, they could combine any flavors they want to, but creamsicle is a thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. They have an ice cream flavor with that. They got the candy, all right. kind of stuff like that. So, uh, Here's the uh, the orange. Let but me get Figo it by the mic. hasn't done it officially. No, Steve, not that I'm aware of. Steve's going to spill is, that all over his desk. We're friends with somebody who works at Fago. <laughs> Don't spill it. Don't you remember? We're friends with somebody who works at Fago. Our our, our, our old buddy Dawn. Oh, she yeah. works at Fago, so yeah. I I don't think she listens to the Voyager Three podcast. But I'm going to put it out into the into the ether. Fago yeah. should make the cream sickle. 50 50 orange and cream soda why not cheers right. and plaster your face right on it and, and don't spill it oh you man do. why is that gotta be so good see it's great i'm picturing myself sitting outside with a record playing a little bit of a breeze it's 78 degrees yeah and it's nice and quiet except for the music life is good <laughs> I, you know i try to bring value to our listeners if, if y'all appreciate value in a podcast Hit like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen, our first order of business in this V3 cast is talking about, and Aaron brought this up. So Aaron, excellent idea. Thank what you. are your top three song intros? This is in no particular order because all three of these are wonderful. I'm not trying to rank them. So my first one on this list is foreplay which is foreplay long time Boston that intro god damn it's so good um it's got everything it's yeah. epic and it has a lot of uh you know since I'm a keyboard player I appreciate the clavinet and the organ that's on there and then of course mm -hmm. it's got full band um as well it kicks in with everything and it's just so bombastic and uh 
really truly is epic. I know that word is overused, but that is truly that w- what that is. And then it just kind of hangs and then uh long time fades in kind of thing. And here's another uh, a cool trivial bit for you. Um those are not even the same players for each of those two songs. Now it is Tom Schultz on everything. But the drummer is not even the same drummer. Oh wait, I take that back. The drummer is the same, but everybody else is different. <laughs> um different bassist uh, on four play, there's a rhythm guitar player, but on long time, Tom Schultz plays all the guitar, but it's seamless. Yeah. And when, when you listen to it on the record, I feel like they're just playing it live right there. Right. That's so good, man. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, a two minute and 25 second intro on a seven minute and 47 second mm-hmm. song, uh, came out in 1976. If no one, if you haven't heard that song, stream it right now and, and, uh, and, and discover it. It's very mm-hmm. cool. Uh, my next top intro, this is a cool one because to me, it still feels fresh. It does. It's, it's, it's from 1990 uh, and it still feels like it's somebody's album that came out right now. And they just thought of this cool intro and it's fresh and exciting, but Thunderstruck by ACDC. I don't think you get a better intro on a song than that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and now I've never seen ACDC live. Unfortunately, this, I just never happened to see them, but I hope at some era that they started with that song, um, you know, open the set with that song. Cause that's, Oh my God, how good is that? Yeah, that is. A that song's picture. in like every movie. It is. That's another Testament to how good it is. It just fits with so much vibage and, and, uh, it yeah. might've been in Dungeons and Dragons or it might've been in Mario <laughs> or something. I feel like it was just in a movie. Oh yeah. I th- it, w- it wasn't Mario brothers, but it might've been, no, and it, yeah, it wasn't Mario. I'm pretty sure. See, um, there you go. Yeah, and that was produced by um, a wonderful uh, Canadian producer by the name of Bruce Fairbairn. <laughs> it's a tricky name because it's Fairbairn. That's you sure that's how it's pronounced? Yep. Yeah. Are you ready for my third installment of yeah? We are pop intros are. of all time. I'm ready. Let it rock. The first track on Bon Jovi, "Slippery When Wet." Also keyboard heavy, but also uh, a lot of guitar. But that. I don't, I don't, what's the name? I didn't, I didn't write it down, but I, the name of, uh, it wasn't written by him. It was, uh, written by J- John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, according to the internets. But what is, uh, Bon Jovi's keyboard player's name? I, I don't remember, but he slayed that. I gotta believe that he wrote the intro because it's very keyboard heavy and, uh, an organ. It's just killer. Like, talk about a way to start off a record that just gets you so hyped. And then it goes into Let It Rock, which is a great rock song, great opener. But yeah, I remember when I first got the Slippery When Wet cassette, I remember the first time I ever heard it. I was like, oh my God, it's crazy. So sweet. that's my three intros, man. Boy, I did not have Steve down for picking a Bon Jovi song. That's a good intro. Now, that whole record is good from top to bottom. Sorry. All sweet. right. So I just, I you're, you're very unpredictable. You know, you're mixing, <laughs> you're mixing pop tonight <laughs> you're picking bon jovi it's wild I, it's wild I don't know what's streets. going on right now just when you think you know you a see person, what i did there see what i did there yeah as soon as you think you know a person right <laughs> all right so for my favorite song intros since aaron wants to go last because he's uh spent a lot of time on his because yeah, it right. was his idea he already knew what he was going to do Right. right. He had it when locked he came down. Up with the idea, he's like, I have this great idea because I've already <laughs> got it figured out and I'm just going to make it really hard on you guys. <laughs> um, so I'll try to keep with Aaron's theme, at least on one of these. And uh, it should come as no surprise when I'm picking for favorite drum intro. Um, Stargazer by Rainbow. Oh, Rosie yes. Powell. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. Probably one of the most badass drum intros I've ever heard so much so that I spent part of a practice one day learning it and I made Aaron film me playing it. Once I, figured <laughs> I remember it out. that. Yeah. Didn't Aaron come up on a ladder to get that good down angle on the drum kit too. I'm pretty That's sure. That's right. I made him yeah. get up on a ladder. That's right, man. We yeah. don't, we don't mess around high quality whenever possible. Yeah. And I, I, I actually have a couple uh, of cozy Powell's solo records on vinyl. Oh, wow. So like he, I mean, he was just a great drummer and died too soon, obviously, yeah. but played on a, on a bunch of stuff. And Stargazer is one of those songs, man. Like it's just, everything about it is good. The drum intro is amazing, but then like the riff is amazing. The whole song's amazing. And you got the Dio vocals. in there. I mean, come yeah. on. 
Right. It, I mean, yeah. that Rainbow Rising record is untouchable. It's it like is. one of the best rock records ever made. Yeah, but it, it is. That's, so that, that's one of the best songs ever. Uh, so that would be like my my drum intro. I have a couple honorable mentions, but I won't even go into them. Um, but interestingly enough, then I thought about okay, so what's an what's a what's an intro like when it comes on the radio that uh, you know automatically makes me turn my car stereo up as loud as it will go. And the first one that jumped to my mind, and I do it every single time I, with no exaggeration. Anytime this song comes on the radio and I hear that intro, I start turning everything up as loud as it'll go because I know what's coming. And uh, last in line by Dio. Mm -hmm. So you guys know how it starts, right? It's real yeah. mellow. <clears throat> right. And then he says, we are coming. Yeah. Man. Dun, dun. And yeah, it's like, yeah. it's so, like, it's, uh, it's perfect, man. Like that, that intro, nothing gets me hyped up like that intro. It's just so well done and executed. And, you know, it's Dio again. I don't know. I'm on a, I'm on a Dio <laughs> thing tonight, but anytime that comes on the radio, I'm cranking. Okay. So that's number two. And then number three, I actually have a song that has an awesome intro with like the most disappointing follow-up. <laughs> oh, I know what and this I, is. I know. And what I this may is. have talked. I, I may have talked about this on the podcast before, but you have. I I have to reiterate it. I know what <laughs> this Gene is. Sim yep. The Gene Simmons <laughs> solo record <laughs> has the best intro of any <laughs> record, and I had it. You know, I bought it. I took it home. It's his face on the cover with the blood coming out of his mouth. It's all he's surrounded in red. He looks like the devil. Yeah. And then you get this intro that sounds amazing very promising creepy. it's promising you things greg it's yeah it's creepy it's got like the the children's choir you know creepiness in there it's building up to all this stuff and then radioactive mm. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. so anyways <laughs> gene simmons was this close right he all he had to do was put a he, all he had to do is put a song like god of thunder or something right, like right after that and he would have been it would have been a home run yeah but yeah. he blew it but i still contend that that ent that intro is amazing yeah i don't know who wrote it or who came up with it but it's got everything you would want to hear on a gene simmons intro mm -hmm. right. or if you're a horror fan it sounds like the intro to a horror movie yeah all right Aaron, lay it's on. time to step yeah. up my man yeah. this right. better be good too well for mine i have an experiment well let me cross off stargazer because that would have been my one drum pick but steve pretend you had to pick a drum intro just out of thin air yeah what would be the first thing that comes to your mind you know, as a favorite drum intro mm, oh man probably can i say two at the same time sure because i want to see if one of these is a hit like what i'm thinking uh hopper teacher van halen and painkiller okay all right still didn't get it but those are those are both great I fully expected you to say flattening of emotions by death. Uh, it's cool, but it's not like an epic intro. It's a great, it's well, I look at it less of a, of like an intro. I don't know. To, to well, me, it's more though, part of the for, song. For my idea, it was like drum lead in guitar yeah. lead in. No, so I not mean, necessarily killer, like epic sure. because epic usually has to be the whole band. So yeah. it, there was a signals were crossed with so yeah okay so i expected you to say flattening of emotions um that's but, a great so drum intro it is i'll say that one for for mine um <clears throat> because it, it's you know it just it just comes in ominously with all these toms and, yeah, just and you, you almost repeating. don't know where one is either it's kind yeah, of you weird. can barely tell until yeah. you've heard it a, a few times yeah and then i i stole this from you because when we when we were teenagers um you said that Anytime you went on a plane, you would listen to that song on takeoff. Yeah. You would cue it up so it was ready to go as soon as the wheels, you know, as soon as the engines started firing up and accelerating. And it's, I was like, well, that's pretty fucking cool. And uh, <laughs> I didn't go on a plane until I was in my 20s. And when I finally did, I had that song ready. And that's always my go to song. Every time I go on a plane, except if I'm doing like, say you do like a layover and then you get back on a plane and on the same, in the same day, I but it's always my, um, starting off my journey, uh, song. Yeah, it's a great um, takeoff song for sure, man. Yeah. 
And then when the guitars come in and everything, it's, you know, it just keeps getting better and better. So, but the drums are a perfect uh, lead in, um, for guitar. Um, one of the best guitar intros I think ever, ever made <laughs> because of the, because of the repetition and the, the anticipation is, uh, Fu Manchu hell on wheels. Um, oh, I love when it too, but I don't know that particular song. By you know, the title. It starts off. It starts off that album. Um, it starts off. Uh, I think it's the Hell on Wheels album, but it's a. Bah, bah, nah, 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 oh yeah, yeah. Bah, nah, no, bah, isn't, that, nah, nah. isn't that King of the Road or no? No, King of the Roads. That's the album. That's the name of the album, and that's later in the album. Gotcha. Like Hell on Wheels is the first song. Yeah, that and, is a what a way to start a record. Jesus, and it's just love it. it. Same thing with Flattening of Emotions. It's this long fade up, <laughs> and it's just this this one guitar riff, and it's just going. And it's got that Fu Manchu tone. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that band, I'd never heard a guitar tone like that. Um, and and it goes on for quite a while. And you're waiting when is and you're waiting for it to get to full volume and then it gets to full volume and you know the drums are going to come in with this amazing fill and uh and it then delivers. everything just just avalanches in uh once the drums hit um so that's that's my guitar pick um, and i saw them live on that tour too i yeah. forgot where i was where, what venue was it the, might have been the crowfoot maybe nice can't remember but it was incredible uh, just loved every minute of it. Just, and yeah. I, I, I got, I saw them a lot in that era. They like probably the started with that. that song, right? Yes, totally. They yeah. Did. Yep. Um, for bass, I, I, uh, I thought out of, um, I wanted to do like a distinctive bass line that brings in the song. And I thought of the one that jumped out at me was waiting room by, by Fugazi. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is so great about that bass line is a lot of times when the bass starts the song, like say, uh, nib by black sabbath uh it it you know it plays the bass and then the guitar comes in and it doubles what the bass is doing so the bass has the privilege of starting the song but it's not necessarily a distinctive bass line but with this i put a lot of thought in this shit but <laughs> with fugazi waiting room he's got that bass line that starts off the album it's the first fugazi song i ever heard and everybody kicks in and the guitar doesn't play what the bass plays Right. Um, even though there's two guitars there, everybody's playing something kind of different. You know what kind um, of bass he plays, don't you? Or did at plays, least did uh, then. He plays a music band. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Stingray. Yep. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a great bass line. One of the best ever. And then synth, I kind of went back to my childhood for one of the very first synth song or sort of songs that I ever noticed synth really. I mean, as a kid, I'd heard plenty of synth on the radio. But I didn't really think about it. Right. But when Iron Maiden did Moonchild, the first song on Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, I I had it's the first time I ever really paid attention to a synthesizer because it was somewhat out of place in an Iron Maiden album. They they did it in somewhere in time, but it wasn't an everyday instrument for Iron Maiden. So to right. start the whole album with the the that awesome uh, sort of loop sort of uh arpeggio it was so great we uh when we were kids when we were vegetarian cannibals we we made a video it was you and me and tim and we were doing all these goofy skits and stuff and the whole thing started at least in our minds it was going to start with seventh son of or with with Moonchild. we didn't know anything about legality or anything it, <laughs> right, it didn't matter right. um but we, we made our video and we're like okay later when we're done with this we're gonna put that song in the beginning so it'll can you imagine starting your video as a band with another band song it's yeah, the most right, ridiculous right. thing but we were 14 <laughs> so we didn't care so uh yeah that's a great synthesizer line <laughs> i remember all of that but I, I i don't remember that we wanted to put that particular song i just forgot about that detail it could have <laughs> possibly awesome. just been in my head and okay. i didn't tell you you know <laughs> it was my plan here's the cool thing though we may have had maybe some signals cross whatever but all these picks are right on the money i think everybody who hasn't heard any of these songs and goes and listens to them i think they'll totally dig them yeah, and I think people who do know these songs know that they're great introductions. That's right. Yeah, yeah. put 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 in the comments whatever your favorite uh, top three song intros are, and it can be by the instrument or just in general. Doesn't matter. Uh, or you can just reach out to Aaron and have him try to explain to you what he's trying to, <laughs> what he's going for, because we still don't understand it fully. 
<laughs> That's so good. Y'all are, y'all are crazy, just dir- man. Just direct message Aaron and yeah. ask him. You know, ask me so about he, the rules of this topic. Yeah. Well, yeah, so he can the rules. clarify, you know, before you post your comment forever on the internet. <laughs> All right. This episode on collecting cool stuff, we have Greg and I know Greg is a collector of all kinds of cool stuff. And I know, I know you have something good and you will not let us down. Ooh, the anticipation. Well, see, this is what I mean. Again, put, being put on the spot. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to preface uh, collecting cool stuff with um, some backstory. So I took my kids up to Frankenmuth, Michigan for spring break. And uh, Aaron knows what I'm talking about. Yep. You know, Frank I love and Muth, Frank. Aaron? I love Frank okay. and Muth. <laughs> love it. All right. So if you're not from Michigan, Frank and Muth is famous for this Christmas store called Bronner's, right? They, uh, they have every, it, it's like a, it's open, what, 364 days a year. It's only yep. not open on Christmas day. Right. So that makes sense. It's like the Walmart of Christmas stuff. It's mm. huge. Like you could spend all day in there. Like it's not a great experience for me, <laughs> you know, because I don't, I don't care about Christmas like that, <laughs> Right. <laughs> but, uh, people love it. And I get, I get the whole, you know, you, you know, so we were there in what March and you know, you're thinking about Christmas, you hear the music, it's all very nostalgic. So anyways, um, you know, we spent all day in Bronner's, everybody gets an ornament, you know, when we go to Frank and everybody gets a new ornament. So I didn't get anything cause I don't care about it. Right. <laughs> um, so ah, humbug. So here's where, here's, here's where, (laughs) this is where the story turns. So what I do care about are, uh, you know, horror movies and, and collecting horror memorabilia. So as it turns out in Birch Run, which is just down the road from Frankenmuth, uh, as you're going back to the freeway, there was a store, I, you know, I was scouring the internet for some, something cool to do before we left. I found this, uh, niche little small store in like out over by where the outlet stores are and it was called the creepy closet and it was just a little tiny horror store so anyways to make a long story short i went in there and keeping with the bronner steam and this is why i bring up bronner's i was able to find this nice man are those man. ornaments it's the trick-or-treaters it like the trick-or-treaters halloween three ornaments oh i didn't so, even know they made that everybody got ornaments so i've got <laughs> how many times are you going to say ornaments <laughs> everybody got ornaments and then <laughs> those I are awesome this, i went yeah, to this man. store and happened upon some ornaments that's great ornaments ornaments <laughs> that, that i liked and there's one more i think you know what it is yes there it indeed. is oh, so yes over. i've got the halloween three collection now so that's my collecting cool stuff story for uh spring break this year awesome sweet find yeah hey man gotta tell you you didn't let us down thank you good job came through came through you weren't expecting all that were you uh i was expecting something cool sweet all right we have a little bit of voyager 3 news to cover um we got a message from uh blake who's doing the uh, scored to death uh documentary film companion album which we're doing phantasm uh cover on he got all the licensing all set um the masters sound good we approved uh, our mastering and uh it's it's off to production man so i'm um, we're hoping maybe by the end of the year um that record will be out but one information is available it'll, it'll be posted everywhere but uh, you know with vinyl production it's a very um, moving target type of thing right now. It's just the kind of the world that we live in right now. So uh, be patient and it'll be available later this year, hopefully. And uh, from what I understand, there's so many cool tracks on there, like Richard Christie, uh, who used to be in death and uh, who's on the Howard Stern show has a track on there. Uh, Alan Haworth has a song on there um, who, you know, worked with John Carpenter on a lot of the classic John Carpenter films and scores. Uh, it's going to be sweet. And uh, the Voyager 3 store, we're going to do a sale all the rest of April. Um, we're going to do uh, our free shipping on any order over $35 in the contiguous U.S. So visit 
voyager3store.com, V-O-Y-A-G-3R-Store.com, and pick up something nice. We got uh, the uh, cool shirt from uh, our, our buddy Craig Horky. We have the creature shirt and the astronaut shirt, and we have that in a, also a bundle. You can get them both at the same time, but uh, we liked his art so much from about, what, what was that, about four or five years ago? We did yeah. Creature, and uh, just last year we did uh, the astronaut one, and they kind of they're kind of companion images, I would say. Kind of yeah. fun stuff. And we have a our newest one's called Portal. And that's kind of like a full color direct to garment style shirt on a soft cotton shirt. We got all kinds of stuff. Tons of New York Ninja stuff, uh buttons, slip mats, uh CDs, cassettes. Do we, we still have, do we still have my favorite shirt of the lady who's like oh. uh yes. Yes, yeah. we do. That one's called Undead. And that's oh, done that's by uh, Dave Black <laughs> out of the UK. Uh, and he also did our Mysterious Traveler t-shirt too. So yeah, we got two that's artists my favorite one who too. did two shirts for us. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So yeah, come on by the store uh, on the interwebs and pick up something. Send me to the post office. <laughs> there you go. Mailbag. This week on Mailbag, the most important thing um, for me is that there was an overwhelming number of people. I mean, like tons of people, like tens, like hundreds of people who were saying, uh, basically talking to Greg and saying um, that no. Abbey Road, Abbey Road is the best. Beatles nobody album. said shit like that. Nobody, <laughs> yeah, they did. Nobody. Where, overwhelming where? numbers like all the people who voted against donald trump all those people were saying <laughs> that abbey road was that, the best beatles album did it also um, uh, did it crash youtube server for a little bit on one afternoon oh, yeah. uh-huh. it did it was crazy it was it was uh you know <laughs> and and i don't even necessarily think abbey road is the best i think that like so many of their albums are, common knowledge there's are two. great and i don't know if i could pick a best beatles album but um common knowledge. they they were saying that it's not revolver mm. it's just what it's they were revolver or rubber soul out there. is what i said and uh those are the two best it's not even debatable so, yeah okay Ooh, look, not look, up at, for look at this controversy let's ask trevor let's ask trevor out in seattle Come on, uh, trevor. which is the best beatles album he says oh let me see here he says, "Yeah, Abbey Road." He Abbey said, Road. He said, uh, "He." I think he even said, "Like chew on that lip." Oh um, man! And, and now uh, he's got to now he's got to use name calling. That's usually yeah. a strong indication that you're losing an argument. Well, that lets you know that lets you know how far back you guys go that he uses that's your just nit- ancient that's nickname. Just nitpicking. And right. he, <laughs> okay, he well, knows then, hey, you well. Then let's let's put it out there officially one more time. <laughs> Everybody, chime in with what is your favorite Beatles album? Leave song it in the comments. For song, song, track by track, Rubber Soul or Revolver. The White Solid. Album. What? No. That, White that album. one's mine because I Let think it be. that was Let the first one I ever nope. heard as a full album by them personally. So that yeah. one stuck with me. Hey, hey, and don't get me wrong. These are all great records. I don't think the Beatles made any really horrible records, but right. Revolver and, and Rubber Soul are the best. Okay. See now that that makes me want to um tomorrow while I'm doing different things during the day I want to put those on and critically listen to them with this framing and see yeah. all right what what is this that that uh Greg Maston is talking about and see and see you know what's up with that what's up all right <laughs> so the whole mailbag this time was to to rub salt in my wound <laughs> there was other stuff but I'm I'm skipping it. all right it's that time again when we want to share with you what we've been watching on tubi the wonderful streaming service that to me besides shutter but shutter is not free it's the best one out there tons and tons of variety in every genre you can think of but they really have a good horror and like italian giallo uh, section and film noir, sci-fi, everything. So uh, we're going to share with you each a Tubi pick you guys can check out. Greg, what'd you watch on Tubi last week? <clears throat> I was very surprised to find um, 
Tangerine Dream in Coventry Cathedral. Have you guys ever seen that? No. No. So Tangerine Dream, so they, they kind of did like a, you know, reminded me of something Pink Floyd would do. You know, remember when Pink Floyd went to Pompeii? Yeah, totally. And they set up in Pompeii and recorded. Well, Tangerine Dream set up inside the Coventry Cathedral in 1975 and they filmed it and, and uh it's on tubi i was surprised to find it on there so the good thing about it is it's only 30 minutes so if you're a uh, tangerine dream fan it's like you know the best yeah seeing them play in, in a seeing them play inside a church so it know? is live that, that, that was going to be my next question is yeah it yeah it was a, it's, i think it's like a live yeah a live concert filmed in at the time and they played in uh the church that's so awesome, man. I didn't know that existed. My, that's my 2B pick. Great pick. See, I didn't even know about that. I guess I probably awesome. don't scroll through the music <laughs> stuff as much. I've been spending a lot of time in the documentary section. I watched the Melvin's nice. documentary. I watched a few others. I think I told you guys. They've got yeah. quite a few uh, music documentaries in there. So yeah. in addition to all the horror and stuff that you mentioned earlier, you know, check out the documentary section. There's a lot of... I watched... Uh, I watched the Donnie Darko documentary on there too about the making of Donnie Darko. Nice. And that was really good. It's got a really long name, but just search Donnie, Doc- Donnie Darko under documentaries if you're interested in that. Look at that. See, Greg gives you three picks. Man, I love it. Yeah. That's, that's good. I spend value. a lot of time on Tubi, man. Mamma mia. <laughs> I know I should save those, man. Now I'm going to be out for the next podcast. <laughs> no, you'll be there. good because you're always you're always scrolling through Tubi. There's always something else to yeah, watch. There's always more. There's tons. Yeah. I got you, uh, Aaron? I got a movie called Steel Dawn, which I remember seeing the poster for back in the '80s when I was a kid, but I never saw the movie, never saw a trailer or anything. I just remember seeing. Patrick Swayze's face with a headband and <laughs> you could tell he was out in the desert or something. Yeah. Um, and I was, so I knew we were going to do the Tubi pick. So th- at that very moment, I said, let me see if I can find something on Tubi right now That's that right. I've never seen. Bam, let's do it. See, so I started it's scrolling in discipline. Yeah. And it was like the third movie I saw and I was like, steel Dawn. I remember that poster and I checked it out and I said, I'll give it like, you know, the three minute test see if it's good in the first three minutes and i said this shit is awesome nice um it's patrick swayze's 1987 directed by lance hool who didn't do very much more he did like a mission uh what is it called the mission not mission impossible freaking delta force he did a delta force sequel um but the music is by film there you go the music is by the music is by brian may who did Mad Max and a bunch of other things. And this movie kind of, I mean, that's why they got Brian May because it's a very, it's a future post-apocalyptic dystopian thing. Um, And it, but it's kind of like road warrior with swords. There's no guns in the movie. Um, I like the sound of that. People fight with swords. And the thing that struck me right from the beginning is you could tell Patrick Swayze wasn't treating this like some sort of throwaway movie, like, he was just doing it for the money or, uh, you know, like thinking of what he's going to do next and just kind of getting this movie over with. He was fully committed to this movie. We know the guy was a great m- mover of his body. We know like he like the stuff he did in Roadhouse with his fighting and the dancing stuff that he did in a bunch of movies. Um and, and 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 the Chippendales audition. I know. I know what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. Yeah, it's all exactly. Good. He committed <laughs> like that to this movie. And so he. You can see that, like, I was looking like, okay, where's the stuntman? Where's the stuntman? And very few times could I see a stuntman. Uh, it was him, and you could see his face when he's doing flips and stuff and sword wow. fights and all these dives and everything. He was, he, this, the choreography, the sword choreography in this movie is some of the best sword fights I've ever seen in any movie. Like, all I didn't these know movies that he could I've do seen. all that. So yeah. that's awesome, man. It was, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he was, he was full on into this. Um, and, uh, it was a really, really cool movie. Great cast. Um, Brian James from Blade Runners in it and a bunch of people, you know, um, and you know, they sort of definitely set it up 
where they could have done another one, of course, but it never materialized. I think it totally yeah. bombed, but it didn't deserve that. It was a really cool movie. So Steel Dawn, check it out. Damn. I See, like Aaron, Aaron didn't disappoint on that one. That was like a hidden gem. Yeah. I've never even seen that. Good pick, man. Damn. Thank you. Man, oh man. Um, I have one that uh, you know, people who like the the horror stuff and the sci-fi stuff um of the 80s, some people don't know deeper i i guess uh, uh some deeper selection so this one is 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 a deeper selection and it's called contamination uh, or alien contamination or toxic spawn or larvae depending what country it was released in but it came out in 1980 and it's uh directed by uh, luigi cozy and uh it stars one of my favorites ian mccullough who is in zombie and uh zombie holocaust and uh, he's a British actor who's s- sprinkled around in some of the horror stuff in the 80s. <clears throat> and uh, it's basically trying to, like, ride on the coattails of Alien. Um, so, so, you know, th- there were a lot of um, movies back in the in the 80s that would uh, kind of borrow from a popular American film that was out. This would sort of be that. Um, there's, like, these pods that they find uh, being smuggled on the ship. And uh, it's from an alien. And uh, if the pod stuff gets on you, your body explodes automatically. This is all. Oh, no, that's pretty cool. In the first sequence. And it's got a goblin score, which I've been a fan of this score for the last 15 years. And it's one of their best ones, in my opinion. So uh, probably about once every other year, I, I rewatch Contamination. And I just caught it a couple weeks back. And uh, it's always it's always good. It's, it's, it's got a, a, a good story. And uh, a decent vibe and great music and uh, Ian McCullough. So it definitely Sweet. is a great uh, 80s uh, kind of mostly sci-fi and some horror type of type of atmosphere to it. So recommend that on Tubi for sure. I'm surprised that you haven't seen that, Aaron, like back in the day when you would do like the four Netflix a week and, yeah. and make them realize we can't. We're losing money on this guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're going to have to change the streaming just because it's one dude. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right. Yeah. I, I don't Netflix for everybody. It might have been on my queue, which was like 300 movies long. Right. So it might have been. And they officially do not do any media anymore. Right. I'm just you know what's sure. funny? I thought they stopped doing that stuff 10 years ago, but uh, my wife said that they still do it. Even to this day, With only a few people out there still do it, huh. but Netflix does still offer that. But I just read, and I found that out like a few weeks ago, and I was amazed. I just found out that they're stopping. Finally, they're stopping like in the next couple of weeks after all this time. Wow. Uh, after, it said after 25 years, and I think most people think they stopped doing it years ago. I, I would have guessed they did like about yeah. 10, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, so for our final segment of this V3 cast, we're going to talk about film remakes. Now, oh, uh, man. Before, <laughs> before you say it, trust me, most of the time, I wish they would not remake a film or reboot a film because uh, it's usually disappointing and I usually uh, don't end up liking it. There's a few exceptions um, that, have, that have come out, but uh anyway i want to i want to ask what would you like to see redone uh because so 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 we're past the point of not of wishing they wouldn't do it now we're just we have to do it so pick one and uh if you want pick a director to do it too you don't have to but i'm I'm going to because because i'm crazy all right so this is this is actually a great topic because i also usually don't like remakes or I sort of grudgingly accept the good ones. But this, when, when you, when you, when you put this out to us, what movie actually does need to be remade? Um, I, I was, I started, my mind started racing because I said, Oh, I have one that as soon as I saw it years ago, I said, this movie actually needs to be remade. And I had to like search my memory banks to come up with it. And finally I remembered the final countdown from 1980. Um, oh, the aircraft carrier on the know? cover? Yeah, aircraft yeah, yeah, carrier. Yeah, I saw that. You saw it? 
Yeah, I a long saw time it ago. years ago, and I thought it was the best premise. You know, this it's 1980. This huge nuclear powered aircraft carrier with all these like you know Top Gun uh, fighter jets and everything, and all the modern full power of the United States uh, Navy. It gets caught up in this vortex. And they don't know that, though. They they think it's a regular storm. And all of a sudden they end up, you know, and they, they're like trying to figure out where they are. And they're seeing all these things. They're piecing it together. And they finally, after however long, they realize, oh, my God, we're back in the past. This yeah. is the day before the the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? And so they have this this unique um choice to make of whether they're going to intercede and stop them um and change history or if they're going to like be uh responsible to the timeline and and not interfere and i remember thinking you better go destroy the whole japanese navy right now just yeah. do it it'll take you 15 minutes yeah with that technology but, for sure <clears throat> right but then they don't do it. And so something happens at the end. I think they're even maybe I think that the commander is actually going to make the decision like he's going to do it. But then he uh, they see the the time portal open up again. The storm comes back and they go, oh, no, this is our only chance to get back. And they go <laughs> back into it and come back to 1980. And yeah. it was so disappointing. I thought it was the most punk way to end a movie. I just was so disappointed. I was like. It's fiction, guys. You could have done anything you wanted in this story, but instead you you chose to preserve the timeline, which is looking around. I know it's not messed with because in this is the real world. So in a movie, we could have accepted that. Yeah. Um, so I didn't like that at all. And I thought this movie needs to be remade with somebody with the balls to actually like go ahead and commit to the idea, to the story. Um you know, when I saw Inglorious Bastards, I didn't sit there and go, well, well, wait a minute. They they can't kill Hitler. That didn't really happen. Right. You know, it was one of the best endings I ever saw in a movie because it was so it was so much what you didn't expect. And they actually carried out their mission. You know, yeah, that was great. And um, that's what I wanted to see in this movie. So I want to see a remake. I didn't think about a director, but, um, you know, I just want to see somebody who would go. And basically, you know, day one, they destroy the Japanese Navy. Day two, <laughs> they go and destroy, <laughs> you know, the Nazis. I mean, they just basically rewrite all of history. And, um, you know, they could even have a, a part towards the end where they come back to modern uh, Earth and everything is totally different. And you just you just have to deal with that. You know, right. whatever they did. It would it would be better than the way they um, punked out with the final countdown, and probably uh, in my movie, uh, my my new version, I would use Europe's um, song to start the movie, or maybe to end. end <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> of course, I'll I'll go next, and then and then we can close it out with Greg because I know Greg's not going to disappoint. What? That's our, that's our theme. Have... That's our theme for guys tonight. Have... No disappointments. <laughs> No you guys put a lot of pressure Greg. on me tonight. <laughs> no disappointment, Greg. Okay, so put me in charge of uh, collecting stuff. Now I'm going <laughs> last on the on the topic I didn't even want to do. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So uh, a, a fun film from my childhood, and I and and when I when I list this film, it's more because I don't think that the film needs to be changed at all. I think it's a perfect film, but. I know how Hollywood is and uh, eventually this film is going to come up on the rotation of, of getting remade because it's got such a history to it and such a great film and uh, it could have a different spin on it or push and pull the vibe a little bit um, and I think it could still survive and, and be a, a great film but uh, just for an experimental sake I would absolutely like to see a new version of 2001 a space odyssey done in modern time um and 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 you, like i say you can push or pull some of the story elements a little bit it doesn't have to maybe do exactly the same thing that the original did 
but I, I gotta see um, Panos Cosmatos direct that. I think it's meant to be to me because uh, he could bring in this other angle to a, a little more chaos maybe or some psychedelicness to it perhaps or just dark and grittiness that the original doesn't have that. Um, it would just be a cool other interpretation of that and I think Panos Cosmatos is the man to do it. So I hope and he deserves it too because he's one of the best filmmakers making movies right now. So I hope all those dots connect in the next decade or or whatever. Um, that would be great to see that. Oh, and yeah. if we're dreaming, maybe Voyager 3 could score it. Yeah. Or if not, then Hans Zimmer. <laughs> if we can't I mean, get it, my, Hans Zimmer can, can take it. <laughs> yeah. If, if my brother's listening to this episode, he's going to wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, did, did did he find uh cuz some people find 2001 a space odyssey too slow. You now, don't like it. I I can see where they're coming from, but to me I don't mind it. I just I just kind of go with it, you know? It's just that's what that does and mm-hmm. I, I think it kind of reflects on how space travel could be because everything is very slow. Everything's got long distances, so you know, to me it lends itself to that spirit <clears throat> and uh, I'm okay with it. But as an experiment, you know, it'd be cool to see someone else's take. It would, since it's modern, you know, it might be <clears throat> more fast paced, maybe, but maybe not because Panos does really cool stuff. Uh, and he'll, he'll take his time on stuff. He's not trying to be all, you know, music video esque or anything like that. So it, it, could, it could still be really weird and should be, I guess. But yeah, yeah that's my pick. Right on. Right on. I could see that. I mean, I definitely could see him making that movie. Yeah. I don't think anybody else could. Right. Well, yeah. So let's hope that's been put out into the cosmos and maybe it'll happen. And I'm sure there's, I never read the book, but um, I'm sure there's a ton of stuff that, you know, Kubrick didn't do from the book that they could mine in a different way. So it wouldn't just be a rehash of the movie. It would be, a re a readaptation of the book you know yeah so exactly that, that makes exactly. some sense so the, so there's a lot of avenues to kind of go in different different uh directions not only because of the story elements that weren't used but because he's such a different director so mm-hmm. all that being said it, it could be a very different take on it, it could be really yeah, cool. the music by us would be great yes yes yeah yeah we'd rise right. to the occasion all right great you're maybe. the closer it's the ninth inning we're up by three <laughs> Uh, the bases man, are one. empty. Come on, Greg. Coffee's for closers. Put this game to bed. <laughs> All right. Well, I thought about this one a long time. And uh, what I came up with is, you know, a lot of the Universal Monsters have had uh, remakes. You know, Dracula, Wolfman even. But the one that never quite got a remake was Creature, the Creature from the Black Lagoon. So... My son loves the creature from the Black Lagoon. You got a little taste of it in Shape of Water. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what made me think about it. But uh, as far as I know, nobody's done a proper remake of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. And uh, I just think it would be cool with, like, today's special effects and, and what they can do with, like, practical effects to sort of reimagine what the creature might look like. You know, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, stay true to the original in, in a way you know, like reminiscent, but, but modernized. And then, you know, you know, obviously the story would have to be, you know, tweaked. And, uh, but to me, the creature from the black lagoon is very much like jaws, you know, like all that swimming when he's like swimming under, you know, she's swimming at the surface and he's like swimming below her, you know, the way that was filmed back then doesn't look all that creepy, but like that could be, it could be creepy. You know, yeah. in a Jaws sort of way to know that, like, there's something under there, you know, watching you. Yeah. So, yeah, of all the universal monsters, like, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I'm not wrong, right? They haven't, they haven't done anything with it, right? I don't think so. I don't still think so. Just, no. Still just the one film. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think, you know, I, I hate the idea of remaking movies, but maybe, maybe that would be cool. That's the best I could come up with. And I certainly could, wasn't going to say. Could kick I certainly it up wasn't going to say Jaws or any of that. Right Don't enough. even talk about it. No, so we could kick it up a notch too, and uh, they could work out a deal with Seven Eleven, and you have to go to Seven Eleven and get your three D glasses, 
go to the theater and see it because it's in 3D. You remember when they did that? Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. And the music by Voyager 3. Yes, Voyager 3 can handle Creature from the Black Lagoon uh, reinterpretation. Right. So what are the other universal monsters? So we got, there's Dracula, Frankenstein's obviously. Monster, Wolf right? and Mo- Wolfman, Frankenstein, uh, M- the Mummy. Does he fall into that? Oh, yeah, the Mummy. Um, didn't they have I Phantom think... of the Opera? I don't know. I don't know Anyways, all of those, as far as I know, all of those have had some sort of remake or reimagining, right. you know, so. Yeah. I feel like uh, that one. Oh, sort they of had Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde too, right? Probably. Didn't they have that? Yeah, that, I mean that comes out every so few, yeah. every so many years with some kind of version of that, for sure. Yep. Yeah, that that's a good call, Greg. See, you didn't yeah. disappoint. That was great. Yeah, that's. I think that is the only one that hasn't been done. And I wonder why. I, right. I don't know. There has to be a reason. Maybe. Maybe it really is that people just don't like making movies that have anything to do with water. <laughs> right. You know, like every movie that's ever been made that has like water as part of it is always like a pain in the ass. Right. Yeah, it definitely Jaws, adds a water element world. to the production for sure. Yeah. You know, so maybe they just, they're just like, nah, I don't feel like dealing with it. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And anyways. it's a cool, creepy creature too. Like they could yeah, do my good kid, stuff. My like son, that. that's his <laughs> favorite. Of all of those, you know, oh, like yeah. he loves the creature from the Black Lagoon. That's why I think like this awesome. generation sort of missing out on it. You know, he yeah. he he actually has the creature from the Black Lagoon like figure up on his cool. dresser. Nice. So cool. I don't know. That's what I came up with. Good job. I can do. Good job, man. You closed it out. That's right. Like so what we'll have would. to see in the next, uh, you know, six, seven, eight years. Is, will any of these come true? You know, you never know. Right. Well, I'm All already right. pitching. I'm already pitching it. That's trying right. to get in. Trying to get in on the ground floor. Yeah, we we have our people talking to their people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got now. Just hear me out. Right, and uh, Voyager Three could do the music, right? <laughs> Can we work that in there? <clears throat> no, but uh, let us know what you guys think. If you have a movie uh, that you think would make a great uh remake uh you know and if you have someone that could direct it if you know uh have a suggestion of who who, who like whose mojo would go good with a, a redo of a film put it in the comments let us know or a movie that we, we might discover needs something. a remake you know like uh i think a lot of stephen king's books have been slighted when it when it comes to movies you know mm-hmm. like the books are significantly better than the movies that come out so i don't know I, that was the other line of thinking I had was some something in the Stephen King realm, but yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Like the Dark Tower, like a lot, yeah, a lot of his movies just end up being really bad, and I I don't know why. It, it's just like a curse of his. <laughs> and then yeah. you know the one the one that everybody loves, he hates. You know, right, everybody right. loves The Shining, and he hates it. So right. I don't know. He's, it's a weird it's a weird thing with Stephen King. That's a good point. The Dark Tower. Are some of the best books I've ever read, and uh, they did one. I didn't even hate the movie, but I certainly it certainly wasn't really it wasn't faithful to the books at all, and it did so badly it killed any chance of uh, doing the series. So, oh wow, you know, bummer! Continuing those, so yeah, they made it. They made an alternate version of The Shining, which was like more true to the book and i've been i trying, never did like, see that i'm trying like hell to find it like streaming somewhere so i could watch it because i am interested in it because i the, you know the book the book is also significantly different than what the shining the movie you know the kubrick yeah. movie yeah so I, I i was always curious to see what that looked like that other version of the shining you know the TV but it's impossible one, right? to find yeah it's yeah, yeah oh it was made for tv i didn't realize yeah hmm yeah, it had the dude from Wings. Yeah, so mm-hmm. if anybody knows where to find it online, where I can watch it, drop it in the link. Drop a link, man. Help help me out. All right. This has been V3Cast, episode 24. Until next time. 